are the poor in spirit, those who see the sin in their hearts. Blessed are the ones who are weeping, cause sin has torn the whole world apart. Blessed are the meek and humble, God will freely give them all things. Blessed are the ones who are hungry and thirst for justice and wait on their king. Hello and welcome to day two in our exploration of the Beatitudes and the second of these statements, Blessed are those who mourn. Do you have a favourite oxymoron? Oxymorons are figures of speech that combine contradictory terms such as awfully good, pretty ugly and exact estimate. If you have a good oxymoron, feel free to post it in the comments below. Uh, yesterday I asked the question, good grief, is there such a thing? Although some people may see good grief or happy are those who mourn as a bit of an oxymoron, I think that grief and mourning can be a good and healthy experience. For as I suggested yesterday, perhaps grief is evidence we loved. It is evidence we cared. It is evidence people mattered to us. Uh, this week we are exploring Jesus' statement, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And admittedly, it would seem an odd thing to be at a funeral and consider those grieving to be blessed, happy, or in any way enviable. Yet, if that grief is born out of love, perhaps they are to be envied. Those who mourn know what it is to have loved and perhaps be loved. I hope this isn't too egotistical, but I would hope that at my memorial service, there would be something more than bravely British stoic displays. I like to think people would be a bit upset. At the death of his friend Lazarus, we read these words in John's Gospel. Jesus wept. And this is not the only time in the Gospels that we hear of Jesus being moved to tears. Towards the end of Luke's Gospel, we read this. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. In this passage, Jesus foresees the future state of a city he loves and he is gutted by it. The Psalms are the song and prayer book of the people of God in the Old Testament and they contain songs and prayers and poems of praise and thanksgiving. There are joyful Psalms, but there is also plenty of lament in there as there is in the rest of the Old Testament. Psalm 137 contains a famous example of this. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs, our, our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? Thinking about their recent exile and deportation from the land, this was not a time for a rendition of walking on sunshine or shiny happy people. Last week I asked the question, does God want us to be happy? And my answer to that is yes. But I also think that at times God wants us to be sad. Uh, the writer of the book of Ecclesiastes states that there is a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. There is a time 
when the appropriate emotional response to a situation is sadness. So if at this time you are looking at the ongoing situation in Gaza or the situation between Russia and Ukraine or at any other tragic situation, whether personal, local, national or global, and if you are deeply saddened by that, then I would suggest that is entirely appropriate. Perhaps better than that, it would be good. For perhaps it is those who are deeply moved by a situation that are more inclined towards prayer and the kind of action that can bring about meaningful change and perhaps ultimately some comfort. Till the night's no more We're gonna shine, shine, shine Till the night's no more Oh, the night.